Awesome. Well, welcome everyone to our very first Lighthouse lesson. I'm super excited to be in front of you talking about one of my favorite subjects, which is planning and preparation. We're going to first start off by reciting our district mission, which is we build new clubs and support all clubs in achieving excellence. That is all of our collective goal as members of District 44 Toastmasters. I'm going to go over a couple of housekeeping rules. One, please keep your phone, computer, pager, if you have one of those old school devices, anything that makes noise on silent unless you are speaking. That way we can just reduce any background noise that we may have as we're going throughout the presentation this evening. As I mentioned to a few of you that we're on, we're going to be leveraging menti.com this evening. So either on your personal mobile device, on your laptop, or you can use your browser on your mobile device as well. You want to go to www.menti.com and enter that eight-digit code that is on the screen. That's 89405240. If you have a smartphone, you can also pop open your camera and hover over that QR code that's at the bottom left of the screen in front of you, and that will take you right where you need to be without any code necessary. The other thing that I'm going to ask of you all is to be present, attentive, and engaged. You get the most out of any training session, any discussion, any meeting that you're in by being fully attentive and engaged. I'm going to ask that of you all this evening. And I'm also going to ask that you have just a little bit of fun. Learning and fun can go together cohesively, and I would love for us to do both this evening. So we are going to jump right in, and I'm going to go over the objectives this evening. So one, we're going to identify tools and techniques that you can use for both planning as well as preparation. We're going to access your current state as well as where you would like to be in the future. So we're gonna look at where you are now when it comes to planning and present preparation. Some people are really good at it. Some people are working on getting better at it. And then we're gonna talk about where you wanna be in the future. And last but not least, we're gonna demonstrate. It's so important not for me to just lecture and have a monologue for this next hour and a half, but to really give you all some time to demonstrate the skills that you're gonna learn and that you already possess inside of you as we go throughout the training this evening. So first we're gonna start with identify. So I would love to hear from you all and you can either drop your note into Mentimeter if you're already inside of there, but I would love to hear what's the goal of yours? What do you want to achieve? Now it does not have to be Toastmasters related. It can be Toastmasters related though. We're not discriminating against it, but I would love to hear from you all. What do you want to achieve? If I can have a couple of people come off of mute, that would be great as well. Tell us what your goal is. We also have the chat, so if you are unable to get on Mentimeter, you can also drop a note in the chat, too. We have some answers coming in on Menti. I love it. So better planning skills. I, you're in the right place for that this evening. Financial freedom, what a, what a great one. I love that. Make decisions more clearly. I definitely have room to grow in that area, so I love that response. Conquering public speaking. I think that's that was a goal for all of us at some point in time. And that's probably how we found our way to Toastmasters as well. To become a DTM, I see DTM on there twice. So that makes my program quality director heart so happy to see those. I love it. So we have people working on their DTM. Efficiency, what a great word. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later as well. And following through on my plan. So not just planning, but actually putting that plan into motion and action. I love it. Awesome answers, y'all. Thank you so much for participating. So how many of you wish you had a couple of extra arms to get things done? I know there's been a couple of days, especially this week coming back from vacation, where I wish I, I had an extra set of arms to get everything accomplished. We have a lot that we get done throughout our lives. We have our pro professional goals. There's a social life that we try to have in between work personal development, we have work demands, and on top of all of that, we also have family. So how, how do we work to get it all done? And that's essentially what we'll be talking about this evening. So when you think about the, the goal that you thought of when I ask you what you wanted to accomplish, what do you wish you had more of to achieve that goal? If you had a word that you can put into what you need more of in order to achieve the goal that you had in mind, what would that be? So again, you can drop your answers inside of Mentimeter or in the chat, or if anyone would like to come off of mute, we can take some live answers as well. 
So in accomplishing that goal that you have set for yourself, what do you wish you had more of? So I've seen t- time twice, <laughs> sanity, <laughs> I love that. Money, again, energy, okay, I'm loving answers. We have resources in the chat. Thank you for that, Tracy. Cedric said time. I see Kelmikas, you have time in the chat as well. Endurance, Oh, what a great word, I love that. Volunteers willing to learn. Sometimes you need a team to get your goal accomplished. See, Nicole put focus in big capital letters inside of the chat. And I love the uninterrupted time. So time that you can have just to yourself to get that particular thing accomplished. Now, when looking at the the word diagram, the larger that a word is, that's the more times it has been input. So if we look just visually at the screen, There's one thing that's a little bit bigger than the others, and that word is going to be time. And what I want to do this evening is change your perspective on time. We run our time. Time does not run us. I really want you to challenge you all to take one or two days and just write down everything that you do throughout the day, from the moment that your eyes open up through the end of the day. Take a sheet of paper and write down everything you do. That is such a great exercise because typically you find that extra time that you were looking for by looking at the things that you're doing that you either don't have to do or you could delegate to someone else to do or that really isn't helping you accomplish the goal that you have in mind. So I want us to change our framework on how we view time because it really belongs to us and we decide how we get to distribute it for the most part. So I want to also talk about not managing our time this evening, but managing our energy. So really focusing on the times throughout the day when we're the most energetic, we have the most to give to any particular task. That's really going to help you be successful. And when we think about energy, you have to think of what type of person that you are. So are you an early bird? Now I'm going to give you a bit of definition of what an early bird is. You're jumping out of bed at the crack of dawn and you are ready to go as soon as you open up your eyes. By 8 a.m., you're still going strong, no signs of sleepiness whatsoever. Midday, you're probably in your stride. That's when you're feeling the most energetic and you're ready to put forth all that energy into whatever goal that you have in mind. By 4 p.m., starting to go a little bit down. So you're losing a bit of steam by the time you get to 4 p.m. And by 9 p.m., you're under the covers and you are tucked in and ready for bed. Now, on the flip side, and the flip side, I'm going to admit is me, is that lovely night owl that we see on the screen. So for a night owl, you are not trying to see the light of day before 10 10 a.m. You you like to sleep in. You don't function really well in the morning. You typically hit your stride around 2 p.m. if you're a night owl. By 8 p.m., you're you're ready to work. You probably have another four or five hours of activity because you like being up at night. And you're sometimes up past midnight before you hit the covers. And then you're eventually inside of the bed. So when you think about those two different personality types, which one do you believe that you are? Are you an early bird or are you a night owl is what that should say. You early bird or a night owl? See in the chat, I see some early birds. We got a night owl. I got a fellow night owl and Marianne. Thank you, Marianne, (laughs) standing up for the night owl. We got a lot of early birds though. Yeah, Kamika, it was difficult for her to choose. I see you, Kamika. So Kamika says she has to choose. It'll be early bird. I love that. Early bird. Okay, Renisha, I got another night crew member. So we got a night owl with Renisha. Tracy is an early bird as well. And I see Cedric is listed as as a combo. The reason why that's important is going to be on the, the coming slides. So when we think about energy management, it's really important for you to understand when you function the best because you want to ultimately assign your most critical or your most priorities to match up with that amount of energy and with that time frame. So you want to schedule all of your priorities during that time where you're at your peak energy because you're going to be able to give your all during that time. You want to make sure, though, that you do take, even if brief, take 
breaks. And I'm speaking to the choir and myself now because I typically sit at my computer all day long without taking a break. And that doesn't make you more productive. Typically, it drains energy from you when you don't take at least brief breaks throughout the day. So you want to make sure you give those breaks. You also want to try to diffuse any negative emotions. Negative emotions take a lot of energy from you. So sometimes you may feel like you're not being productive and you're trying to figure out how you're going to get it all done. And all of those thoughts are taking away the energy that could be leveraged to put towards the goals that you have. So you want to try your best to diffuse any negative emotions that you may have when you're trying to get work accomplished. It may be taking that break and just stepping away because you feel overwhelmed. Maybe you step outside and take a little bit of a walk, calm yourself down and come back to the task at hand, but make sure you're allotting time for you to take breaks. You also want to reduce any types of interruptions when you need to be concentrating on a task. That means that lovely mobile device that we all typically have glued to our hand that needs to be powered down in a way where it's not going to interrupt you. The same with your email inbox. So if you're working on a PowerPoint presentation, for example, shut your inbox down so that way you're not seeing those emails pop up in the middle of you doing your presentation. Typically, if there's any way for you to get distracted, you will if you're trying to concentrate on a project. So you want to give yourself an advantage and turn off anything that's going to distract you from the task at hand. You also want to identify your sweet spot. So what are you really good at? Are you really good at creating PowerPoints? Are you really good at separating your tasks into priorities? Figure out what you're really good at and try to put the things that you have to do into those buckets. So find a piece of what you do really well inside of everything that you do. That gives you a sort of a small victory every time you're accomplishing a goal because you're finding the silver lining in every task. Now, I'm not saying every task that you have to do will be fun because we all know that that is not the case. But if you can find a little bit of a silver lining in the things that you have to do, that typically makes it a little bit easier for you to accomplish and you make sure that you ultimately do that task. You also wanna make sure you live your core values. That's super important from a personal perspective because you don't wanna be doing anything that goes against what you believe in. It's really hard for you to even get something done that you don't believe in. I remember I had a, a sales job way back when, when I was selling Kirby vacuums door to door. So that tells you how long ago this was. And some of you are nodding and laughing. So you've heard of the Kirby vacuum before, but I wasn't in it. I didn't care for the vacuums. And you could tell that by the way I did my sales pitch. So a lot of times when your heart's not in it, you're never gonna be able to complete that task most of the time. So make sure you're sticking to the things that align with your core values. And then when you're planning every evening, you wanna think about what's top priority for me tomorrow morning? What is that one thing that I need to make sure I do first because that's the priority because that's gonna set the tone for the next day. So you're planning the night before for the next day. And that's gonna help you be a little bit more organized when you wake up because you'll feel like you have at least a little bit of a plan to move forward through that next day. All right, so someone put efficiency in the, the chat as well as in Menti earlier as if they knew what slides were gonna pop up on the screen. But it's really important two important words that you're going to see on the screen, which are efficiency and effectiveness. Now, there is a difference between those two words. When we think of effectiveness, that's really just hard work. That's did we complete the task? As you'll see on the slide, that's more results oriented. Did I get done what I needed to get done? While efficiency, on the other hand, is how are you completing your priorities? In which manner did I get the task done? Again, that's looking at more streamlined. Did I do that job optimally or not? So that's the difference between those two words. One is more hard work. The other one, you're thinking smart work. Did I do it the best route? Now, when you think of those two things, which one is more important? Would you say effectiveness or efficiency? Again, effectiveness is hard work. Efficiency is smart work. Which one? See some effective effectiveness in the chat from Pedro, efficiency from Katrina, efficiency. I see a both inside of the chat as well. 
Manisha said she's part of the efficiency crew. Okay, I see Rona and William are both a part of efficiency as well. Looking on the screen, that matches what's in the chat as well. We have 91%, 92% that say efficiency and 8% that say effectiveness. Now I'm gonna tell you as a trick question because both are equally important and I'm gonna show you why on the next screen. So take a scenario one says, we were efficient, but we were not effective. What that means is we completed the job quickly, but we didn't accomplish the goal that we had set out. So even though we got it done quickly, we could kind of consider it to be optimally, it wasn't effective because we didn't get the end result that we wanted to get. Scenario two is not efficient, but effective. So we're looking at something that's effective, but not necessarily efficient. So we got the job done. We did the hard work, but it took such a long time to get it completed. We could have gotten it done in a shorter amount of time. Scenario three is neither one. So you're neither efficient or effective. And that means it takes you a long time to not get the job done. And we never wanna be in that sort of situation. But the last scenario is really where you want to be when it comes to planning and preparation. You want to be both efficient and effective. So that means you completed the project quickly and you achieved the goals that you intended to achieve. So you were successful in the end and you did that and completed your goal in a quick manner. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Pareto principle. So the Pareto principle is, is some people call it the 80-20 rule, but the rule really states that only 20% of what you do can equate to about 80% of the return of your energy. That means that everything that you do does not go into getting you towards your goal. There's only about 20% of the tasks because those tasks are so meaningful and they help so much moving towards your goal that really, really help push you towards your goal. Now, this makes it even that more important for us to figure out what our priorities are when we're trying to reach our goal, because we want to make sure we're doing more of those actions that are in that 20% that are moving us towards accomplishing our goal. A small chart that you can leverage where you're trying to figure out if there's a particular item or task that you have on your to-do list that you should be doing or not. So really determining whether is this a part of that 20% that's going to give me that maximum efficiency or not. So when we look at whether the item is important or non-important, or is it urgent or not urgent? So I put a couple of different examples inside of here. So one, when we think about urgent and important, those are your crises. So those are the thing, the glaring problems that pop up that you need to take care of immediately. There are any deadline driven projects. So if you have something that's due tomorrow, that should probably be your priority instead of something that may be due later in the week. Urgent, non-important can be a whole lot of different things. One, interruptions, right? So we talked about distractions earlier. So we want to reduce those as, as much as possible because those are not going to help us move the needle forward. There are also times when certain calls, emails, reports, and meetings also sit into that not important category. So we want to be mindful of that. When we look at not urgent and important, those are things like preventative maintenance. So doing things to make sure that something else really, really bad doesn't happen later on down the line. It's important, but it doesn't necessarily have to be done this moment in time. The same with relationship building when you're out networking. It's really important to meet new people and to have that camaraderie, but it's not something that you absolutely have to do right at this moment. And then when we look at not urgent and not important, you have busy work. So work that is not accomplishing any kind of goal. It just really has you busy and takes up your time. There's also some emails as well as calls and leisure activities that fit into that space as well. When we think about it from a more professional aspect, there's another chart and matrix that you can use, which is your action priority matrix. So when we think about our actions and priorities from, a, like I said, a more professional or business perspective, there are things that fit into the high and low priority. And then across the bottom, you have the effort. So low and high effort. So you're thinking about impact and effort. Where am I going to get the biggest bang for my buck is really what this chart narrows down. So we have in the, in the left-hand top, when we're thinking about something that's high priority, you have quick wins. So that's low effort, but high impact. 
That means something that you can get your goal accomplished really quickly, and it doesn't take a lot of effort on your behalf. You want to really pinpoint those items as soon as possible in any type of, of process, because again, that's going to give you a quick win, and that can really help boost your morale as well. So taking something that's really, really large and breaking it down into bite-sized chunks so that you get those small wins can really give you an energy boost moving forward. When we think about high effort and high impact, those are your major pro projects. So it's gonna take a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of effort, but it also has high impact. So that energy that you're putting into that task is gonna pay off because of the fact that it has that high impact. When we look at that bottom realm, you have fill-in, so low effort, low impact. So it doesn't take a lot of time, but it also doesn't really move the needle. So you really want to decide and, and, and use your discernment there with whether you should be doing those activities or not. Yes, they have low effort, but if it's not really impacting, is that some place where we should be spending our time? And then last but not least, uh, the term for this always cracks me up, thankless tasks. <laughs> So I think you guys can get a gist of what that means just by the, the wording, but it's high effort and low impact. So you put a lot of energy into it, a lot of time into it, but you don't really get thanked for that because there's no payoff for the effort that you put inside of it. All right, moving forward. We're going to focus on two areas that I know I've seen people talk about greatly where they struggle with planning and preparation. One of those is their email inbox. <laughs> and the second is, is during meetings. So we're going to talk about both of those areas briefly. So when we think about email management, you want to take action on an email as soon as it's received. And again, that's taking into account that you're able to action it. If you're driving or doing something of the other nature, we're going to wait till we get to the safe spot in order to action that email. But as soon as you see it in your email, email inbox, you want to action it. So you either want to delete it, it may be spam or something that you don't need to take care of. So we're going to delete that right away. You either want to reply if it's something that you know the answer to and you can answer quickly. You want to reply to that email. It may not be for you, right? So this is where delegation sometimes comes into play. If it's for someone else, you want to make sure you forward that on to the person that's going to be responsible for that task. Or you want to add it to your calendar. So maybe you can't reply right at the moment. So you're going to add a tickler or a flag in your calendar to come back to that particular email to answer it when you either have the knowledge to answer it or you have the time to answer that email. You also want to make sure that you organize your inbox. I cannot express how important this is. So that's creating folders so that you can categorize your emails. My email inbox is completely color-coded, so I know exactly what's coming in, who's sending it, and whether that's a personal Toastmasters or work-related email. You can also flag your emails. That's really helpful because it sort of creates a to-do list for you. So if there's an email that you did not get a chance to reply to, you can click on the little flag next to the email. And you can actually search your inbox just by the flags to understand what your, your day is going to look like and what goals and tasks you need to accomplish. The last thing on this slide is to automate your emails. So you do have the capability to schedule emails. That is one of my favorite tools inside of my email box. So I'll type up an email the night before. I'll say, hey, Google, I want you to send out this Gmail at 9.30 a.m. tomorrow morning. I hit send and schedule, and that completely goes out tomorrow morning. So I don't have to think about it. I don't have to get up at 9.30 a.m. to make sure that that message is sent out at the time. I can set it for whatever time that I want it to go out. You also want to leverage templates. I'm a firm believer in not reinventing the wheel. One of my kind of life hacks when it comes to Toastmasters is leveraging your email signature. So this might be something that our VPMs could use. So I used to have a signature that had a welcome packet message to our visitors. So all I had to do was go in my inbox and click welcome signature. That's what I called it. And it would populate all of the wording that I wanted to include in the email to a visitor of my club. You can do that for any type of scenario. Maybe you want to do a check-in with your members and you have that as a signature. So it's a great tool to use because you don't have to keep copying and pasting or typing that email over and over again. It exists in your email signature box and you can just hit that drop down and use it as a template. 
Then last but not least, there's a feature where you can send specific email types to specific folders. So as the email comes in, I could say, hey, Elaine's sending me email. When Elaine sends me email, I want it to go into this particular folder because I'm going to look at those priority. Or maybe there's an email coming in for your manager. Anytime my manager emails me, I want that to be top of mind and front and center in this particular folder. So that helps you organize, even if you're not in a place to move the email physically yourself. Right. Moving on to creating to-do lists, as I mentioned earlier, you can leverage flags because flags can help you create a to-do list. There are also tasks inside of most of the inbox types where you can create a task and a time that you want to complete that task. So it'll pop up a little notification when that time arrives to so make sure that you stay on task. I also leverage draft emails. So I'll draft up an email and have it just sitting in my draft of all my to-do items for that day. I like doing that because it looks like it's, it makes a little notification on the draft. So every time I look at my inbox, there's a little notification. So I know I got to go back to that. I know I have to go back and complete it. So it has a number one next to your draft folder whenever you have a draft inside of it. And that reminds me that I need to go back and look at that and make sure I do all the to-do to -do list items. And then I delete it once I've done everything I was supposed to do. Another way that you can manage your inbox is to actively manage subscriptions. We get a lot of emails from a lot of different places. Sometimes we may have accidentally clicked on the wrong thing and then that person's emailing us every single day after that point. So make sure that you're unsubscribing from email subscriptions that you no longer wanna receive that information because there are times when they're filling up your inbox with things that you really don't want or need to see. Another way, ironically, that you can keep your inbox organized is to respect the inboxes of others. So if it's not something urgent that you need to email, don't send the email, right? Because that's a, that creates another email that comes back to you. Sometimes there's the back and forth when people are trying to understand. Maybe you pick up the phone and call if it's something that you need to explain instead of sending that email. That creates the ability for you not to have 10, 11, 12 back and forth emails for something that's complex that you could easily explain over the phone. You also wanna just be thoughtful of what you click on, especially the things that you sign up with your email address. So that's what that moderate your inbox exposure means. It also relates to, again, making sure you take breaks. So not sitting and answering email after email after email for hours and hours and hours because that drains your time. And that leads right into our taking breaks. Now we're gonna jump over to, to meeting management. So we wanna make sure we're being mindful of the times and the reasons why we set up meetings. I don't know if any of you have experienced this a time in your life when you've been invited to a meeting and you're like, they could have called me for this. Or, or this could have been an email. We were in here for 10, 15 minutes. I really still don't know what the meeting was all about. <laughs> there wasn't really an agenda, wasn't really prepared. And I don't understand why I was invited to the meeting in the first place. You do not want that to be your meeting. So generally speaking, you should not hold a meeting unless it feels fits into one of these categories on the screen. Now I will give the caveat, this does not pertain to Toastmasters meeting. So don't say, hey, Tanisha told us to stop meeting because <laughs> it didn't fit into one of these categories. But meetings in general should only be conducted under these several circumstances. One, you wanna eliminate confusion and uncertainty. Like I said before, I'm gonna set up a meeting or a call because the email correspondence is getting a little clunky and I wanna make sure that I'm clear. So I'm setting up a phone call or a conference call or a meeting for us to really hash out what we need to hash out. Or you may need to generate ideas. So maybe we're putting on an event and I need to hear from my team about the ideas that they have for the event. Maybe there's a need to stimulate action. So there's something that needs to be done and I need to talk to my team in order to motivate them in order to get this particular action done. So that's another reason why you would hold a meeting. Four is for you to clarify or reinforce your goal and, and objectives. So maybe there was a particular goal that you had that you don't feel like your team is really understanding. So you wanna get them together and say, hey, I wanna reinforce what we talked about previously. Let's go back to, and start from scratch and really reevaluate what we've been doing and seeing if it's really going to help us accomplish the goal. The next 
reason why you should have a meeting would be to define roles and responsibilities. So letting people know what part they're gonna to have to play, whether that's in an event, or maybe there's a meeting or a presentation coming up, you wanna make sure everybody's clear on their roles and responsibilities. Solve problems. Something comes up, some process breaks down, you gotta get your team together in order to work out a way to solve that problem. And then last but not least, to disseminate information correctly. So sometimes you wanna set up a meeting so that everyone hears it from the horse's mouth, for lack of a better term. Everyone hears the same mes message and you get everyone on the same page. So when it comes to meeting preparation, you wanna make sure that your attendees have all of these things before they step foot into the meeting. Well, they need to know where it is. That's kind of important when it comes to creating a meeting. So whether that's the date, the time, location, if it's in person or the Zoom link, if it's virtual or whatever virtual platform that you're using, they need to know the purpose of the meeting in advance. So don't just drop a calendar invitation on their, their inbox without giving any explanation or definition about what that meeting is gonna be about. They also need to know what to bring and what to expect. One of the things that I like to do for my meeting is send out an agenda in advance, let people know what I expect of them when they get to the meeting. So that way, by the time they get to the meeting, the meeting is a working meeting. You're not spending time saying, okay, this is what I need you to do. This is what I expect, but that has already been taken care of. So by the time that you get to the meeting, it's really just you all working on a task at hand. You also want to make sure that they know how long the meeting is and you want to stick to that time frame. If you ask for an hour, be respectful of that time and try your hardest to make it just that hour. And then they need to know of any special arrangements. Is there a particular parking spot that they need to park in? Is there other people going to be on the line that they need to be aware of that may be higher up in the company or the organization? Those are the types of things that they need to be aware of. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to start on time right? As much as we can. We know that things happen. Technology it is sometimes not our friend, but we want to, as often as possible, try to start our meetings on time. You want to welcome everyone. I do something, or I try to at every meeting, at least, called a wellness check. I want to know how you are as a person. Before I jump into asking or making demands, just from an emotional intelligence perspective, how are you? Are you okay? How are things going in your life? How was your day today? So make it personal, even if it's business, to build that connection. You want to reiterate what the meeting purpose is. Again, you've given that to them in advance, but you want to reiterate, hey, I set up this meeting for us to talk about event X, Y, and Z. You also want to establish an open atmosphere. So let everyone know that their opinion is valued. Even if you disagree, you have to validate and give the space for someone to have a different opinion than you. So create that open environment. And that will really help with the next bullet point, which is get everybody participating. If you notice that there's someone in the group that hasn't really spoken up or given their opinion, maybe call on them and say, hey, Jennifer, I, I haven't really heard you say, what are your thoughts about this? So that way you get that person's input. And also ask questions to your audience as well, just to make sure that they're on the same page as you. So those are just a couple of nuggets in, in relation to meeting management. You also want to make sure that you stay on track with the agenda. It's not helpful if you send the agenda in advance and you deviate from it to the point where people can't even recognize what meeting that they're in. You want to keep yourself on track. You want to use transitions if, if necessary. If there's a part of the agenda that's taking too long, you have to learn how to pivot to make sure that it doesn't derail your meeting. So learn how to adjust to say, hey, that's such a great point, Joey. But we have to move on to our next agenda item because I want to be respectful of everyone on the line's time. You want to try where possible to work to consensus. That's not always possible. There might be a disagreement that takes precedence over the meeting and has to be talked about at a later time. But you want to try and get everybody on the same page and in an agreement on the way to move forward. You're going to summarize what you talked about during that meeting before you end it emphasize any agreements created. Sometimes people get amnesia by the end of the meeting and they forget what they signed up for and that they said that they were going to do. So before you get off the line, you're going to you're gonna want to say, hey, Laura, you said that you were going to be bringing the drinks and the snacks for our next meeting. I just wanted to remind you before we get off. That way, everyone cl hears clearly what the follow-up actions are. And then last but not least, another really, really important thing is to thank the individuals that have taken their time to join you. Time is one of the few things in life that we can never get back. 
So you always want to thank your participants for going out of their way to come to a meeting that they didn't have to be at per se. Okay, so that is all about meeting management. So I'm just going to put up this quick summary of some of the things that we have talked about that I like to call my life hacks. So we're just going to do a quick review. One, prioritization. So deciding which tasks that you have on your agenda are the most important and making sure you do those first. Divide your large tasks. So I don't know if you've ever heard of the phrase of how do you eat an elephant? And they say one bite at a time, right? That's always a response. So making sure you divide up your large tasks into small ones so that you can get some of those small wins and keep the energy as you go through. Organize around your energy. So early birds, night owls, make sure you understand what your energy levels are. Make sure you keep that inbox maintained. So email management, automate tasks where you can. So that way you, don't, you can set it and forget it. You don't have to worry about it later on. One thing we didn't dig into too deep was leadership delegation. So don't be afraid if you are a leader of a team or a manager of a group to delegate tasks. I know that was something that was really difficult for me. I didn't want to give anybody work or put anyone out as a leader, but I had to change my thought process and thinking of whose blessing am I taking away because I'm taking on everything. Whose learning opportunity did, did I just completely demolish because I didn't want to let go? Right. So when you change your mindset into thinking that you're helping other people learn and grow, it gets a little bit easier to delegate and allow someone else to do the work. Make sure you have follow up procedures in place that we talked about in your meetings, making sure you reiterate what was agreed upon so that we don't get anyone forgetting what they need to do. Eliminate distractions of so turning off those cell phones when you're doing priority tasks. Make sure you're realistic about your time as well. So what can I really truly get accomplished today and what should I really put on tomorrow's agenda just based on my energy level and my time? And then last but not least, you must rest. It is not an option. If you don't set up time to rest, your body is going to make you rest. So you want to make sure you, you are intentional about that rest time. So that leads us into a breakout room activity. So we are going to do a prioritization activity. So this, these are the little nuggets about Zoom. So you're going to go into your breakout room. Where you get in there, you want to select a scorekeeper. And I know that sounds interesting. Some of you are like, hmm, scorekeeper. That's the first in my Toastmasters meeting. But we'll talk a little bit about what that person will do in a second. I will be making some broadcasts just to let you know about timing. Um, and you can leverage the chat if you all want to talk to one another once you get into your breakout rooms. Okay. If there are any questions that you have, you can hit the question mark button and I'm happy to come in and talk with you as well. So here is the activity instructions. You're going to join your breakout room. You're going to engage with your group about prioritizing a list of tasks that are going to get you points. So you're going to see a list of tasks. There's going to be some points associated with those tasks. You're going to have to work with your group to decide which tasks you're going to complete in the time that's allotted to you. Okay. Everyone is only going to get 10 minutes. So it's not going to be a whole lot of time. So you're really going to have to work with your group on, okay, which activities do we want to do? Which ones do we not want to do relatively quickly? After that 10 minutes, you're going to come back into the main room where I will be waiting for you all to chat a little bit about what your experience was. We'll talk about how did you come to the decisions of which tasks to complete, was there someone that took the reins at the beginning of the meeting? How did that work out for you all? Okay. So on the next screen, I'm going to show you the task. I'm going to ask that you either take a picture or a screenshot. As long as someone in your group has it, you will be set. And I will give us a minute to do that before we open up our breakout rooms. So again, take a screenshot or take a picture. But about 30 more seconds. For seconds. All right, so we're about to head into the breakout rooms. It's 7.09 now, so we're going to come back out 
at 7.20. All right, I'm opening up the rooms now. Go team three. Oh, I love it. Something like team three. I love, I'm loving the com camaraderie. I'm hearing yeah. team three's name a lot. Yeah. I love that. That's awesome. Perfect. So we're going to talk about two questions. And first, before we get into the questions, I want to know what, what were the points? So what were the points that were added up by the scorekeeper? Let's go to room one. So that was Angela, Anil, Annie, Barb, Elaine, Karen, and Kimberly. What was your score? Um, so our scorekeeper is Annie. Is she on here? Is she already back from the breakout room? Yep. So we did everything. Um, as far as the nickname, I don't know if we got that one because it was like towards the very end, but everything else we completed. I thought we were the uh, uh, early one. But yeah. uh, each member of a team has to give him or herself a nickname. I don't think we did that. No. Yeah, that we got the, those extra or those additional five points. I love right. it. All right, room two. So that's Cedric, Earl, Lady Lee, Lee, Norman, Octavia. Is it Saikithia? I want to make sure I say that oh, right. So 10 points, yeah. So how many points were in room two? Yeah, you were close. Tried, I tried. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so what were the points like in room two? Um, yeah. Hey, Tanisha, it's hey, Earl girl. and uh, Team Two. <laughs> uh, so twenty-five. I guess I need to add this up real quick for our name. Forty-five. And forty-five. We got our pets and the children, and the nickname is fifty-five. We got ten slogan. Sixty. Sixty-five. Sixty-five for us. Keep it rolling. I love it. That's good. Six, seven, hundred. Yeah. That's good. Room yeah. three. I think we got them all. We got them all. We got them all. Oh, we, got, is... we got a hundred. We got leave anything on the table. We got them all. Love got it. Them all. <laughs> I would leave it. <laughs> nothing on the Drum table. roll, please. Drum roll, please. <laughs> and the strategy was, it seems like we went for the highest numbers first. And then, then we worked back. We worked out. Pretty good. I love that. Room mm -hmm. four. Let's see, that's cool. Robin, Speedy, Sunshine, The Champ, <laughs> Tommy Thompson. This, was this is this is Speedy, which is Rona. We got 81 points. Nice. Good job, room four. And then room five. So that was Gail, Lisa, Marianne, Pedro, Stephanie. Thanks. We should do our Amazon noise. <laughs> <laughs> do we get extra points for that <laughs> it was fun it was we, fun we got all except the uh the last one which was 10 points i guess what does that give us 90 points that's good that, that's, that's, that's or 80 90 90 Okay, um, awesome. Well, yeah, good we stuff. I'm glad you all enjoyed that activity. That really teaches you how to prioritize your time. I was going <laughs> to give you five minutes. I was like, that, that might be too little. That, that would have been interesting, though. But you can see how changing the time would have affected your priorities. So you have to think about, would I have done something different if we had five minutes? What, what would we would have attacked versus having those 10, 10 minutes? But it really helps you look at, OK, where, where should we spend our energy? What are the higher points items? But the higher point items took more effort, right? So you needed to do more things in order to get those those higher points. So I hope you guys learned a, a little bit about prioritization and, and doing that task. Was there any pressing takeaways that you all learned? Was there something impactful that came out of that or a lesson learned when it comes to prioritization? Uh, stress yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, stress whatever. yourself. Yep. Mm -hmm. And you have to be flexible as well. When, when what was that, William? I'm sorry. Be flexible when you're in the negotiation process for the good of the team. Absolutely. <laughs> 10 minutes is not a whole lot of time, but there are going to be times where you have to come to a consensus in a small amount of time. Yeah. So how do you do that? 
You have to learn how to strategize as well, too. Definitely strategizing. And, Shared uh, vision. Sure someone is a note keeper. <laughs> yeah. And limit the time, talk time. Yes. Team. <laughs> Teamwork. Yeah. Teamwork. Absolutely. Nicole put in the chat, can't belabor anything too long. Absolutely. You can't spend a whole lot of time talking about one thing because there are all these other options that you want to try and get. So you can't spend that much time on one. So I, I love all those responses. We got be strategic. Communication is a negotiation sometimes. I love that. Stretch your ideas. So really great takeaways from that lesson. So we're going to pivot a little bit into looking more at the assess side of things where we think about planning and preparation. So you have to think about what's in it for you. So thinking about that goal that we had top of mind at the top of the call that you had, what's in it for you or you're with them as we like to call it in Toastmasters land. What's in it for you when you think about the, the next goal that you want to accomplish? So again, you can either type that in Mentimeter, drop in the chat as well. But what's in it for you? And the reason I ask is because it's really important to understand not just what you need to do to get something accomplished, but why you are doing it. I always tell people why is one of the most important questions you can ask yourself about anything. Why is going to get you to the roots typically of any problem that you have going on if you ask it enough time. So asking yourself, well, why am I doing this particular task is going to help you decide if you should be doing it. And also it'll help you decipher how you should be doing it. Okay. So we had a lot of great responses, improved confidence, personal and professional growth, creating efficiency, peace of mind and self. I love that one. Personal and professional growth. My voice is heard, which is awesome. Get to level five, I saw in the chat. I love that. Make sure goals are met is in the chat as well. Progression is a great word as well. And prep for longer term pro projects. So those are all great reasons to be doing things. And we never want to lose that understanding. Okay, why did I sign up for this? Because every task is not going to be easy. Sometimes you're going to have to use that why to push you through. And then we talked about the different types of tasks that you can have. But a lot of times, if it takes high effort and it has high impact, at some point in that process, you're going to get a little derailed by things that happen. You have to leverage your why in order to keep going and make sure you move towards completing that goal. Just an example. So I use my, my role as program quality director and I use an example of if district leadership is my goal, here are a couple of things that could be my why, right? So growing my communication and leadership skills, expanding my network and meeting more people is a requirement for my DTM. So that district leader, I could use the, the opportunity to have now for that. To share the ma magic of Toastmasters, I get to talk to all of you this evening, right? And meet all of you. So I'm sharing that magic and to potentially become a distinguished district. So coming together as a group in order to help us accomplish a, a common goal isn't something else that could be in it for me. So those are things, again, that you want to think about whenever you're doing anything. So once you have your why, why do you think after you have that, it's important to plan? Why is planning important? Why can't we just, just never plan, just do everything we want to do whenever we want to do it? What makes planning and preparation important? And again, you could drop that in Mentimeter or you can drop it in the chat. Maximize our time and output. Thank you, champ. I think I'm going to start calling you all these, these nicknames afterwards as well. <laughs> Not going back to real names. It's going to be the nicknames. You should always be going for a goal. I love that, Kimberly. I love it. We had someone compete on, on the, the world stage uh, earlier last week, Fernando, and he talked about setting a goal and aiming to reach that goal. So that, that helps you keep moving forward. Foundation and the step set sequence. I love that, Pedro, in the, in the chat. It enables you to prioritize. So understanding what needs to be done first, second, third, et cetera. Resources are limited, yet we do not have an endless supply of everything. So sometimes we have to be really mindful of how we use the things that we have, because there may not be an endless supply. It may be depleted after a certain amount of time. Keeping things organized. Goals are just dreams until you put a plan in place. Ooh, I love that. that that's awesome. And then reaching goals. So great, great answers. 
I tell you, you put in the chat, when the team is happy, everyone is happy. I love that too. So we're going to talk a little bit about setting SMART goals. And I'm sure you all have heard of these before. A couple of these can be different words. You might see time bound instead of timely and things of that nature. But we always want to make sure that our goals fit under the SMART goal category. And that's specific, measurable, attainable, real, <coughs> and then timely. So we're quickly going to go through what these mean. So starting with specific is really the five W's and the H, right? Who, what, when, where, why, and how. You want to be extremely specific with your goals. I <laughs> uh, used to tell me that, hey, you know, when you get older, you're going to pray for a husband, but you want to be specific when you pray for that husband. You can get one, <laughs> but it might not be the one that you want, right? So pray specifically. So she used to tell me that and that stuck, that stuck with me all of my adult life. But you want to be specific in your goals, not only just specific, but intentional. So I really want to put some thought into this goal because I'm putting energy and time into that goal as well. Next is going to be the M. So you want to make sure it's measurable. You want to be able to tell how well you're doing in that goal. If you don't have to, a way to measure it, you don't know if you're moving towards completing it or if you're taking a couple of steps backwards. So you really need to understand how can I measure my success as I'm working towards accomplishing this goal? How will I know when I've made it and I've done what I needed to do? Some of those goals are easier to determine. For example, your, your DTM, right? You'll know when you get it once you've completed those steps. So that might be a little easier. But maybe it's, hey, I want to grow our club by 50%. So you're really having to know, okay, what is that 50%? What if we lose members? Does that still count? So those things you might have to try and calculate and really make sure that you measure how you're doing. Attainables. So we talked about being realistic. Yes, I would love to be the president of the United States tomorrow. Is that attainable for me? No, it is not, right? So when thinking of our goals, we want to stretch ourselves. We want to make sure we still sit in that realm of it being realistic. One, because we don't want to get discouraged. Sometimes when you set a goal that is not attainable, you spin your wheels and then you feel like you're not doing anything right. So we talked about those small wins and creating opportunities to get those wins. A part of that is making sure that the goal in mind is truly an attainable goal. So when you have the right attitude and the skills that you need in order to accomplish that goal, or you know how to obtain or where to go to hone those skills and those attributes that you need in order to complete that goal. Realistic as well. So how willing are we to do what needs to be done to get the goal accomplished? You have to be real with yourself. Am I really going to do the work that's required of me to get to where I'm trying to go? Anything worth having is going to cost you something. It always does, right? Whether that's your time, your energy, whether it's monetary, it's always going to cost you something. So you have to ask yourself, am I willing to give that something up in order to get to where I need to be? So how long until you want to achieve the goal? What is my deadline? Is it in a week? Is it in a month? Is it next year? What time frame am I looking at? Because that'll help you strategically put into place the steps to accomplish it as well. So knowing how much time you have to complete it is really important. So we talked about setting up SMART goals. So now we have our goal. We have what's in it for me. We, we know that we're creating SMART goals. So that's going to make sure that that goal that we selected is truly one that we want to accomplish. How do you get there then? So how do you create a success? a success map. Now, when you think about creating a success map, it's really a plan to accomplish your goal. We can say that in sort of layman terms. So in looking at the options on the screen, where do you think you would fit when it comes to creating a roadmap for success? So do you have a, a plan and you're going to try and follow that plan? Do you not have a plan at all, but you know how to create one if you need one? Do you have a plan and follow it diligently? So you really, really hone in on that plan. Or do you have a plan and you try to follow it the best you can? Sometimes you go off track a little bit, but you have a plan and you try your best to follow that plan. Where do you fit in that category? Again, you have a plan and follow it diligently, have a plan and you try to follow it the best you can. You don't have a plan, but you know the steps to create one. 
or you don't have a plan and you are unsure of how to even go about creating a plan. Let's see what that, that group looks like on the line today. So it looks like most of you have a plan and you try to follow it, right? I think a lot of us sit in that category. We create a plan and we try our best to make sure that we stick to it. There's some bumps in the road, right? There might be a roadblock. We might make a left instead of making a right. But eventually we get back on that road and start following start following that plan. So I, I love to see that. And hopefully for those that don't know what their plan is or how to start it, that this session will help you just a little bit and starting to think about the things that you want to include inside of a plan for your success. We're gonna talk about a couple of things that you can leverage in order to assess the, the plan once you have set it. So we have the goal, we know what's in it for us, we set a SMART goal, we have our plan. So how do we assess where we are and if we're moving forward in that plan? So we're all really familiar with the moments of truth. I'm sure you've all heard of it before. It really helps us assess our clubs inside of Toastmasters, but you can also leverage this outside of Toastmasters. It doesn't have to just stay focused on your club. It's a tool that you can pick up and lift and shift and put it towards any other activity or task that you have. And really all a moment of truth is, is really so someone's impression or impact that's created by what you're doing. So they're looking at either the quality of the service or how you completed a specific task that's really helping you assess where you are. Now, there are six components to the moments of truth. We have first impressions, which you all know very well. That's, hey, you never have a second time to make a first impression. That's just right off the cuff, someone either meeting you and getting an impression of you based on their interaction with you. And the club is the same thing. Coming into the club, were, were they greeted or not is something someone may measure first impressions on. We have member orientation. So really, how are you making your members get acquainted with your clubs? You can change that a little bit on the personal side and thinking about how you're introducing yourself to others. So am I presenting my true and authentic self when people meet me? Am I really giving them a good orientation to who Tanisha is? Or did I send my representative when I met that them during that meeting? Fellowship, variety, and communication. So keeping things open and friendly and making sure that you're communicating. Again, that equates directly to the personal side of things outside of Toastmasters as well. Program planning and meeting organization. So keeping your meetings lively, again, can relate to inside of Toastmasters to work as well as to your personal life. Membership strength is probably the only one that really hones in on the Toastmaster side, but you can pivot a little bit and make it relevant to your personal life. So membership strength is really making sure you have enough members to successfully put on a meeting inside of your club. I think of it on the personal side, do I have a good board of directors? That could be a personal mentor or someone that's really helping guide you through life. Do I have people in my corner that I can go to that are truly going to be honest, brutally at times with me and let me know where I stand with my personal goals? So that's somebody you trust, you built that rapport with that can help shift and guide you in a personal space. And then achievement recognition. So that's making sure you celebrate the successes of your members and your club as a whole, but also your own achievements and accomplishments. We don't celebrate ourselves enough, even outside of Toastmasters. Make it a point to celebrate the small wins. You gave your icebreaker, that's an achievement right? You took on a new role in the meeting that you didn't have before. That's an achievement. You participated in a contest for the first time when you haven't before. That's an achievement. We need to make sure that we're recognizing all of our achievements. Okay. Average what I call a SWOT analysis. So I see this a lot more in kind of the professional side of things. So that's looking at your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and your threats. Again, this is applicable to both the personal side of life as well as to the Toastmaster side of life because it gives you areas where you can focus on and work on. And it also gives you the things that you're really good at so that you can continue to do more of those things. So this is what the setup looks like in, in a blank format. So you set up a quadrant and put those words into those spaces. And then you start to write down what fits into those categories. So again, maybe my strength is communicating with individuals or making sure people feel welcome. Maybe one of my weaknesses is I'm not as good and efficient in writing as I am in person. So how do I make my emails and things that I write translate the same way I do in person? 
So this is a great way to really assess where you are or where your club is at inside of Toastmasters by using this format. I'm going to show you in a second just an example of if you were to evaluate your Toastmasters club. So here are some examples of all four of those categories from a Toastmasters perspective. So maybe we're really strong at putting together a plan and getting our officers together, but we really aren't on social media at all. And that's an opportunity for us to gather more, more members. So that's a weakness on our side. A threat could be we have low attendance. We don't have enough people in order to fill all of our club meeting roles. And maybe an opportunity is maybe we need to do and have someone come in and talk about pathways. We don't have a lot of our members that are completing pathways projects. So let's use that opportunity to have a pathways champion come in and talk to our group about pathways. And that leads us right into talking about the club success plan. So for those that may not know or haven't been an officer before, the club success plan is a document that sets the club up for success at the beginning of the year. This is what all of your club officers, if you are not a club officer, should be working on at this time. It is doing exactly what we've been talking about all day, right? Really taking what are our goals, what's in it for our members as, and as well as our officers, how do we set ourselves up for success by making sure the goals that we put into this document are SMART goals? And then how do we continue to assess throughout the year, maybe potentially changing the club success plan as we go throughout the year? So it outlines what your club culture is, so the things that make your club unique. What is the current state of the club? from all aspects. So if we think about moments of truth is really measuring all aspects. And then what are our goals for the future? And that they're putting pen to paper in order to create that plan. Here's another look at some of the sections within a club success plan. So it goes over all of those different sections. We talked about club culture a little bit, your committee values. So that's about your club officers and the values that they wanna uphold. What are your education, membership and training as well as administration goals? And then what actions are you gonna take? Because we can all spit out goals until we're blue in the face, but until you create actions and do those actions that are gonna help you accomplish those goals, they will just be words on that paper. The benefits to creating a club success plan, and again, you can leverage this in your personal life as well. I have a document where I go through and say, hey, this year, I really want to focus on X, Y, and Z. I do a word of the year, so something that I kind of stand on and live by, and I revisit that throughout the year. So you can create a personal success plan as well, just the same way that you would set up a Toastmaster success plan, and then continue to hone that as you're going throughout your year. But the benefits are when you have your steps in place in order to help achieve excellence. You will have specific actions. So a lot of times when you write down those specific actions that enables you to focus on them, if you have a really large goal, sometimes it's really intimidating to figure out where to start. So if you have smaller actionable items, that really helps you dwindle down and hone on what you need to hone on. It helps you support club achievements and then it promotes engagement, retention, and growth throughout your club as well. All right, so what we're gonna do is one more breakout activity and this one is gonna center around Toastmasters planning. So again, here are all of your amazing tips and tricks for breakout room. You'll see that your scorekeeper has changed to spokesperson. So keep that in mind. You're gonna have a spokesperson in your room. And here are the instructions for our upcoming breakout session. So you're gonna go into your assigned breakout rooms. You're gonna engage for the, your group in discussions about creating a club success plan. So on the next slide, I'm gonna give you a scenario and that's where you're gonna talk about in the groups that you are made up of. Um, we're going to make it 10 minutes. So I do want to make sure that I get you all out of here on time. So we're going to make it 10 minutes instead of that 15 minutes. So you can make that note to yourselves. But when we come out, we are going to spend at least one minute and try and get feedback from each group on how their conversations went, what they came up with as far as strategies for the club success plan for this particular club. So on the next slide, this is going to give you some information about the club and scope. So you can take a picture of this, screenshot it, or whatever you need to do. I'll leave it up inside a Mentimeter as well. So if you're on Mentimeter, it'll stay inside of your phone or on that tab that you have. So I've given you a look at the dashboard. So this gives a, a view of 
a club and where they stand currently. It shows you what goals that they have accomplished as well down at the bottom. And then it gives you some feedback about the club on the left-hand side. I'm not going to read all the bullet points, but it says wants to grow 10% beyond the requirements. So that could be beyond education goals, beyond membership goals. It struggles with converting guests to members and provides aggressive feedback to help membership grow. So those are a couple examples of where the club sits. So what you're gonna do when you get in your breakout rooms is talk about if this were your club, what would you want included in your success plan? What goals would you create? What areas would you wanna assess to make sure that you accomplish those goals? So you're gonna have 10 minutes in your breakout rooms. Again, make sure you take a screenshot or a picture of this screen. And I am going to open up the breakout rooms now. Hey, I hope that y'all have a great conversation. So now I want to hear what you all talked about in your breakout session. So in thinking about that club scenario and the, the different characteristics that you had, as well as their dashboard activity, what would you suggest this club include in their club success plans? I'm going to put this on Mentimeter in case anyone wants to drop notes in that are not the spokesperson. But I would love to hear from the room. Just quick one minute, because I know we only have about four minutes left. So room one, 30 seconds or less. That's Curious, Elaine, Irene, Karen, Kimberly, William. What's the takeaway that you would tell the club to include in their success plan? Um, that they need to start doing some um, open house to gain members and to retain members, uh, incorporate the members more than just the executive team. So everyone feels like one body, one team. Love that. One team, one dream. I love it. So room two, Earl, Jamie, Jennifer, Lee, Lisa, and Mary Ann. One takeaway from your session. We talked about perhaps the VPE can encourage members to do their speeches and to get involved in pathways and see the rewards from that. I love that. Get involved with path pathways. Awesome. Room three, Anil. Barb, Nicole, Rona, any feedback from room three? Hey, one of the things that we were going to do was help them use technology by creating perhaps a QR code and capturing guest information using the QR code. There was a discussion if, if we capture things through QR code, then can it disseminate information into Fritos host? I thought that was a really great question, but those were some of the things that we talked about. Uh, of course, we have to follow up with people when we capture the information as well. But that was one of the things that I thought was very useful. Yeah, I love that. That goes back to us talking about automation earlier. So love that. Room four, Angela, Annie, Cedric, Gail, Octavia, Sasha, what's one takeaway from your room? Okay. We talked about um, diversifying the membership. Um, we also talked about instead of providing that aggressive feedback, um, just providing supportive and constructive feedback. We also talked about uh, as far as relying just on word of mouth marketing, um, incorporating social media marketing as well. Um, last but not least, we have room five. So that's Tommy, Kamikas, Norman, Stephanie, Sunshine. <laughs> what, what was the takeaway from room five? Well, we had a few. Um, some of them have already been mentioned. We talked about having a pathway ambassador to come in and do some member training to help you know members grow. We also talked about having a shared vision and sharing the club goal so that we were all working toward you know that one goal. We also talked about using a buddy system or mentors to help you know individual growth. I love that buddy system. It always works best when you have that accountability partner, that person to help you when you need help. That's a great idea. I love that. Awesome suggestions, you all. Thanks so much. So we're going to move forward. We are at one minute left, so we won't have time for Q&A, but I will say if there are any questions that you all have, you can always reach out to me at pqd at d44toastmasters.org, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. 
So I'm going to give just a couple of closing remarks. One, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for taking time out of your evening to join us. I hope you have found this time to be helpful. And there's at least one thing that you can take from the session and implement it in either, either your personal or into your Toastmasters life. On the screen, I have some announcements with some events that we have coming up. So we have the very last division director-led TLI that's taking place on August 28th. We have one of those division directors, Toastmaster Bob Wallace is on the line. So if you do have club officers that have not attended training, please, please, please make sure that they attend that training or another one at another district and that program quality director needs to email me to confirm their, their attendance. But please make sure you take a picture of these events. Would love to, to see you there. We have some fun stuff coming out up. The Project Reunite that's helping some of our clubs that have 12 or less members and giving them creative ways to get their membership up. Pathways with purpose. So making sure you're doing pathways in a way that aligns and you can incorporate it into your life. We have our next Lighthouse lesson that will be all about quality clubs. So that's in September. Our new members have a fireside chat with the senior six. So any new members that are new Toastmasters from July 1st until now will be invited to have a fireside chat with the senior six. We have our fall business meeting that will be coming up towards the end of September. And then we have a conversation about branding. So public relations discussion coming up at the end of September as well. Here are some of the incentives that we have going on now. So we have that TLI one right in the middle. So anyone that attends that 28th session, it is still up for grabs to get some of those incentives. We are in the middle of Smedley Award as well. So if you add five new dual or reinstated members between August 1st and September 30th, you'll receive 10% off your next order at World Headquarters, as well as a ribbon to go in your banner. And then if you have any new club leads, we want to make sure we're sharing the gift of Toastmasters. You want to make sure you're emailing our club growth director that, that lead. And there is an incentive if that lead becomes an actual club. So last but certainly not least, I would love for you all to drop in the chat. What is one thing you learned from this session that you're going to implement in either your personal or professional life? as well as we are all about feedback. So I would love if you would take an assessment. I'm gonna drop that link in the chat as well. So I'm gonna do that now before you all start dropping in what you're gonna implement, but that link is in the chat. I'll make sure I drop it in a couple of times as well, but we'll love your feedback on the session. If you found it helpful, that helps us as a district team, make sure we're bringing you content that you all want and need to help you get better in your personal and your professional as well as your Toastmasters lives. With that, that is all that I have. I want to thank you all again so much for your attendance this evening. You have been such a fun audience. It's always great getting a chance to get in front of you. And I look forward to seeing you all around at the next district event. Have a wonderful day, everyone. This was amazing. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank and you. I will say this was recorded. The recording will be going up on the D44 Toastmasters YouTube page. And anyone that joined the session, I will send out the PowerPoint to you all as well. So that way you can have it for your use and reference as your goal setting throughout the year. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. You're welcome. So Good, much night. Good, Good night. Good so, night. You're welcome. And just in case anyone did not get that QR code, I'm throwing it back on the screen as well for you. I'm trying to make Tanisha a quick question. Thank you. Sure. I'm going to stop recording. Give me one second.